Good afternoon, everyone. I know, you're a quiet group. We're, we're expecting a very engaging and lively conversation, so uh, we're going to have to perk it up out there. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the state of fair housing and the resegregation of America. And I, I, I first want to introduce to you our panel up here. My name is Kim Keenan. I'm the general counsel of the NAACP. And to my right, I have Shauna Smith, to my left, I have <laughs> Shauna Smith, and I have Jacob Vigor. Vigor, yeah. Vigor. And then on the right, I have Harvey Epstein and Diane Huck. And um, let me just tell you what they do, because they don't want me to do a long bio for each of you, because you're going to get to show who you are by what you say. So Harvey Epstein is the Associate Director of the Urban Justice Center. Diane Huck is the of counsel at Emory Selly Brinkerhoff and Abadi LLP. And Shauna Smith is the President and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. And Jacob Vigdor is the Professor of Public Policy and Economics at Duke. So, so let's talk about what that means, because what you're going to hear from my, my, the panel up here very, very shortly is, is this really the resegregation of America, or is it the re-resegregation, or is it just the plain old ordinary segregation of America, or in fact, have we been desegregated and some of us just don't know it? So with that, I'm just going to throw that out, and, and let's start at one end of the spectrum so that we can get to the other end. And so I'm going to ask Professor Victor to start us sure. out. Sure. Right, thank you, Kim. Uh, so, so my name's Jake Vigdor, and I'm an economist by training. Uh, and uh, for the past, oh, uh, it's, it's at least 15 years now, I've been working on a project uh, with some colleagues of mine up at Harvard uh, to measure the amount of segregation in American metropolitan areas. And uh, so we've put together statistics that go all the way back to 1890. And we've measured uh, segregation in American cities and metro areas in every census from 1890 to 2010. And so the, the basic idea is as follows. Uh, in 1890, uh, there wasn't much racial segregation in American cities because there wasn't much racial diversity in American cities as of yet. Uh, that changed a lot between 1890 and about 1970. Uh, the, the, what we call the Great Migration brought a lot of African Americans out of the rural South and into cities in all parts of the country. Uh, as the African American population of cities grew, segregation increased. Uh, segregation was enforced by a lot of mechanisms. Uh, you had restrictive covenants that were uh, enforceable up until 1948. Uh, you had redlining practices uh, by the federal government uh, that restricted access to mortgage credit in certain neighborhoods. That practice continued on uh, well past the civil rights era. Uh, you had other forms of discrimination in housing markets uh, that were not really outlawed until the Fair Housing Act of 1968. What we see in the data for the period since 1970 is that racial segregation overall has been declining. Uh, the places where you see the most rapid decline are in the cities of the Sun Belt. Uh, these are the places that have been growing a lot. Uh, these are cities, it may surprise some people to know that, that the cities of the South, places like Atlanta and Charlotte, uh, these places have always been less residentially segregated uh, than the cities of the North. If you want to see real segregation in action, you need to, to go to places like Chicago and, and, uh, and Detroit and some of the more industrial cities up North. So, so you, we have this decline that's been happening overall. Uh, but another, thing, uh, another phenomenon that's been going on at the same time, if you look at economic segregation, so the, the segregation of the rich from the poor rather than black from white or, or, or white from non-white or any other way you want to slice things racially, economic segregation has actually been increasing over much of the same time period. So now the phenomenon that we observe is that there's a set of neighborhoods in the United States that seem to be uh, open to just about anybody so long as they have the financial means to access them. Um, and uh, one uh, remaining issue is that there are, there are some families that don't have the same degree of unrestricted residential choice as others uh, because they don't have the means. So, so we. One thing that, that I, I want to emphasize from, from the outset is that by saying that segregation has been declining, you can't necessarily use segregation as the perfect barometer of how much discrimination is going on in the housing market. 
uh, the fact that segregation has declined means that, that at least some families have managed to move into neighborhoods where you didn't see that type of family before. Uh, but that's not to say that there aren't other families who uh, might have thought about it and, and were unsuccessful in their efforts to move or who encountered some sort of uh, explicit or implicit barrier along the way. So we look at the data. Uh, we see a decline in, in segregation overall, but uh, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm an economist by training. I'm not a lawyer, but I've been involved in a couple of housing discrimination cases, and so I know that it's out there. Uh, but when we look around and see uh, what's going on with segregation in the United States, we don't necessarily want to look at this, this decline in segregation over the past 40 years now and say that that's telling us something definitive about discrimination in housing markets. So, Ashana, what would you say to that? Well, I think you can see some um, decline in residential segregation. Um, where I would take exception is with the economic issue. There are a lot of middle and upper income African American Latino families across this country who because of discrimination are not allowed to even view houses in predominantly white neighborhoods, let alone make an offer to purchase on those homes. So it, it's um, naive at best to think if you have the money you'll be able to live wherever you want to live. We have a lot of lawsuits that have been filed recently, even out in the Sun Belt states, where African, an African-American doctor was trying to buy a piece of land for $250,000. And when the sellers who live next door saw the real estate agent bring him to see that property, um, she asked when the offer came in, was it from that black guy? and she refused the offer. And uh, a lawsuit ensued. I don't think they got enough money in the settlement of that because it was only about 250000 I thought they should have gotten a whole lot more money in damages. Um, you also have to recognize that out in the Sun Belt area, they have what's called the sundown towns where people of color were told to get out of town before the sun went down if you wanted to stay alive in that area. And so you have all these stereotypes, you have all this history of discrimination that is a barrier for people to consider neighborhoods. So unless we have affirmative marketing by real estate companies, unless we have a lot more affirmative advertising about available properties, I don't think that we'll see people of color being able to have access to those communities. And we need, clearly need a lot more enforcement in order to open up neighborhoods that have been closed. Now, on the other hand, there are a lot of white people living in those predominantly white neighborhoods who would like to be in an integrated neighborhood. They, I'm not a new house person, so it's hard for me to embrace the suburbs, but there are lots of people who live out there who don't want to move to another neighborhood to have integration, they would love to have diversity in their own communities. So we have created an advertising campaign called A Richer Life to reach out to white people to say, if you know a real estate agent is steering people of color away from your neighborhood, you can bring an action under the Fair Housing Act because white people are protected if their opportunity to live in an integrated setting is being diminished or denied by real estate companies, by the local government, um, by anybody who would prohibit them from having that opportunity to live in an integrated neighborhood. So we have to address this segregation in a way that encourages white families who want to live in an integrated neighborhood to make sure their community is open and people of color to have actual choice. But choice only exists if the communities of color have the same kind of city services, schools, economic opportunities, employment opportunities as the suburbs. So in, under fair housing, we address all of these issues. It's not just the National Fair Housing Alliance doesn't say what you're supposed to do is move people of color out into white neighborhoods. That is not our philosophy. 
Our philosophy is that all neighborhoods should have a high quality of life and that people should want to, to move into those neighborhoods because of the high quality of life that exists there. Um, we know that's not a reality in America, but part of what we do under the Fair Housing Act in settlements is to help rebuild those communities so that people have real choice of where they want to live. So I'm going to bring Diane into this conversation. I just want to make a, a comment of my own. I, I still remember my parents buying on a block that was all white, not just predominantly white, all white. And I remember uh, my mom talking about how the realtor was fired for selling us that house. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't so long ago, although I feel like it now. But, mm -hmm. but he, you know, it, this notion that he literally had to call her so that he could get his fee because he didn't know if it had closed because they fired him because they sold the house. So even if it's, you know, measuring discrimination is a very interesting thing because it's, it's not necessarily that you couldn't buy the house, but that because you bought the house, mm -hmm. now the white realtor has been fired mm -hmm. because he has um, basically changed a block that was all white mm -hmm. into a block that had one black family. So Diane, did you want to weigh in on sure. that? Sure. Um, so for me, the way I look at the relationship between segregation and discrimination is that Segregation is a consequence, uh, historically, as, as um, uh, Jacob explained, a consequence of federal and local government action to create uh, separate and unequal neighborhoods. Um, discrimination is one of the mechanisms for maintaining that separateness within our communities. It's done in different parts of the countries in different ways, but the consequence is the same. And the divide that is still the starkest is the divide between white and black. In New York City, there's a neighborhood in Queens called Astoria. It's a neighborhood that's very racially diverse ethnically. Uh, Asians live there, Hispanics live there, uh, new immigrants from a variety of different countries, including uh, uh, countries in the Middle East live there, whites live there. African Americans do not. And what the Fair Housing Justice Center in New York found when it went to the largest apartment building in Astoria, Queens, and sent white and black testers undercover matched same gender, same family size, same income, and wearing recordings so that we could prove after the tests what was said and told to them. What they found is that if you went there and you were not black, you were immediately shown available apartments that were vacant and ready to rent. You were given an application form. You were encouraged to come back and apply. If you were black and you walked in the building to see an apartment, you were treated very nicely. In fact, in every single test, the black tester was greeted, was told, oh, you know, if you had just come by this morning, I rented the last apartment this morning, but you know, call me. We get apartments in the future. I'm sure you'd love the neighborhood. Uh, and here's my number, call me back. But over a period of six months, no African-American tester ever got beyond the apartment was just rented, or there's a waiting list, or I'm out of applications, or the tenant hasn't moved out yet, I can't show you the apartment, and yet an hour ago, a white tester was shown a vacant apartment in that building. So the white-black divide, I think, is still very stark in terms of how segregation manifests itself and in terms of where we ought to be targeting um, our enforcement resources and testing to try to understand how discrimination and systemic discrimination helps to maintain that segregation. I also want to talk about the notion that we live in a more in integrated society because I think we're looking at a global issue of, let's say, cities, but within cities there are neighborhoods. So if you look at a neighborhood, another neighborhood, you could say like the West Village in, in Manhattan, which is 1% African American, right? So in a city where people can live, 1% of people who live in the West Village are African American. In the Bronx, in the South Bronx, 1% of the people 2% of the people in the South Bronx are white. So this is in a city that's a racially diverse city where we would say that there's more integration in New York, but in reality, we live in a very segregated city and we have lived in a very segregated society. So uh, I would have to, we have to think about the notion of what integration means and what integration means within communities and not just because cities, because cities are not, are not a monolith. A story is different than Jackson Heights. You know, the West Village is different than the Upper West Side or Washington Heights. And so when we think about those things, we need to think about how our policies 
whether government or private actors are involved in discriminatory acts, continuing to enforce segregation within our society. And that's what we need to be, we need to be acting on, not that statistically there are more diverse people living in cities. I think statistically the United States is a more diverse place. So we have to say if the United States is more diverse, then our neighborhood in theory could be more diverse. But the reality is that we're just more segregated because we're, we're more people are marginalized and separated. You look at the schools, and a, and a prime example how we see this. I mean, in schools, uh, you talk about where kids go. You know, 82% of the public school kids in New York City are black and Latino, right? But if you look at the specialized high schools in New York, it's one example is you probably heard about is Stuyvesant High School. That less than 5% of the kids are African American, even though 82% of New York City public schools kid, children are black and Latino. Why is that happening? What is going on in a city where we're looking, where we have integration uh, because we have a multicultural society, but because of what government's doing, but because of what private actors are doing, we're encouraging segregation. So, so then let me go back to you, Jacob, and say, so is there selective segregation? Is there some sort of link between neighborhoods and schools? There, well, <clears throat> So think, uh, you think about it this way, where, uh, historically speaking, where you live determines where you go to school. Uh, you know, the, the historical pattern is to have neighborhood schools. Um, the, uh, that's changed. So in a lot of larger cities, certainly in places like New York uh, and Boston and Chicago, there's been a movement away from neighborhood schools towards patterns of, of greater school choice. Um, in a city like Chicago, for example, a greater school choice within the city of Chicago is not necessarily going to stand to integrate the schools all that much because there's not a whole lot of white students in the schools to begin with. Uh, the white students in metropolitan Chicago, you'll find them in private schools and you'll find them in the suburbs. And school choice within the city of, of Chicago doesn't change that. Um, the other thing that's ha that happens in the school system compared to neighborhoods is that starting in, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, you had a lot of cities that were under court order to integrate their schools with busing. Um, busing efforts have been in decline. Of course, we had a Supreme Court decision in the, the Louisville and Seattle cases a few years ago that basically said you couldn't do any anymore. So school segregation is a, is, a, is a different story than neighborhood segregation. So the neighborhoods, you know, I understand, you know, we can tell stories about individual neighborhoods that, that continue to be segregated, right? So the south side of Chicago is still overwhelmingly black. Uh, you know, there are lots of neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly white. But if you look at, if, if you just look at the sum total of neighborhoods, and you know, you, you get, what you have to understand about a lot of these segregated places is that the share of the American population that lives in these types of neighborhoods has been declining over time. Uh, the movement has been to places like Atlanta or uh, places in, uh, in Florida where you actually get a, more of a phenomenon that involves integration of into individual blocks and individual neighborhoods. Um, we don't see that translating into schools quite as rapidly because at the same time the neighborhoods are moving in the direction of integration, the school systems are not busing anymore. Uh, and so the net effect on the segregation of schools is, has basically been canceled out by that. So that's, that's an important thing uh, to keep in mind. You know, I, I, th I think that these, you know, we've, it's, it's fairly easy. This is, this is a country with thousands upon thousands of neighborhoods. And when neighborhoods have an established character, a, 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 w when they gain the reputation of having a certain, um, racial character. So in other words, you know, once people get to know that the south side of Chicago is, is a black neighborhood, what the research tends to show is that those designations are pretty hard to change. They don't change very rapidly over time. The place where we've seen interaction happening, I, I'm saying integration happening, is actually in some of these suburban communities, right? So places that don't have any kind of racial character yet because nobody lives there yet. Uh, so if you look at the street that I live on in Durham, North Carolina, which is a, you know, which there's racial diversity on our little cul-de-sac, uh, that, that cul-de-sac was nothing but farmland uh, until about 12 or 13 years ago. And in these kinds of places, this, this notion that you have people out there who want to choose an integrated neighborhood, 
where can you find an integrated neighborhood to choose? In a lot of cities, the neighborhoods are established, and you, you can't just have a concerted action to say, hey, let's, let's just go integrate this neighborhood. Residential turnover happens one family at a time. But in situations where you have a new neighborhood that's sprung out of, uh, out of a green field, these are the situations where we see systematically that the likelihood of integration happening in those settings is higher. So, so let's add on to that, and Sean, I want to ask you about, so in the home ownership market, because in a way we're talking about many things when we talk about housing. We're not just talking about um, where people live because they own a house. We're also talking about where people live because they rent or because they, you know, they lease. So starting with the home ownership issues, I mean, if anything, more recently what we've seen is a stripping of home ownership, and I just want to have you um, lay out for us, you know, what that has done in the community. Well, if you, you have to start with the um, predatory lending practices that were going on in the 1990s in um, African American communities, but they started with African American seniors because they had equity in their homes. And they perfected their policies and practices of pushing these predatory loans, primarily on refinancing a home in a, in a market where there was high equity. And the seniors that were African American, and there's a lot of research done in Philadelphia about this, how they lost their homes because they had six month adjust adjustable rate mortgages. And the mortgages adjusted at a point where their house payments would double every six months. And the, they would then refinance, they were encouraged to buy insurance and this insurance was paid up front in the closing costs. So, and the insurance was usually about eight to $12,000. So if I had $40,000 of equity in my house, I paid closing costs, which were jacked up, and this, mortgage, this other insurance in case I had a loss and had to file it, which they never paid it. And they would keep flipping my loan until they stripped all my equity. Once the subprime predatory lenders perfected this in the African American community, first with seniors, then with families who had equity, then in the mid-2000s they started this practice in middle-class white communities. You, you guys look so young, you probably don't remember who the money store was and some of these other businesses who went out there and flipped these homes. And once they started um, perfecting it, they tried to hit the Latino community, but they didn't have enough crooks who spoke Spanish. Um, but they actually went to the um, chicken slaughterhouses in Kansas and recruited Latinos from the factories so that they could penetrate the Latino home ownership market. So the National for Housing Alliance, National Council of La Raza, NAACP, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights in 2007, I think it was, or six, we held a national news conference when the foreclosure crisis hit and we said let's have at least a six month moratorium on foreclosures so we can figure out how serious this is going to be and people won't lose their homes. Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, we met with him and he um, said that we didn't understand economics. And we explained to him that this was gonna be a global international crisis but because we were not economists, our views were not respected. I did have the opportunity to point out to him a few years later that we were right. Um, <laughs> and what did he say to that? He hasn't spoken to me since oh. then. Uh, but that's okay. He don't need everybody to talk to you. Yeah, that's right. And so we saw that foreclosure crisis hit, and we saw the real estate industry as a partner in this, because they kept pushing the adjustable rate mortgages. You can afford more house, here's your payment, here's what you can do. Now, they say to me today, well, Shauna, we didn't know it was so bad. I said, you know, you guys claim that you can help people with financing, 
and yet you were steering people into these horrible low doc, no documentation, no interest loans for a period of time, adjustable rate mortgages, instead of talking to people about the safer 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So we saw huge loss of home ownership in the United States with primarily African American and Latino families, working class white families, and we see now the, the results of that foreclosure. We knew, I've been doing this since 1975, so I know about lending redlining. When I was in Toledo, we brought more lending lawsuits than anybody in the country. And when we saw this foreclosure crisis, we said, if they redlined, if they were discriminating when these loans were going out, what are they doing now that the banks own the homes in all of these neighborhoods? And so the, the color photographs you have on your seat are evidence from uh, our investigations, just a little touch of evidence. And what we found, we went out and we compared the treatment of foreclosed homes, which are called real estate owned or REO properties, in black, white, and Latino neighborhoods. We looked at communities that had, had high home ownership rates. We looked at middle class, working class communities. We didn't look at very low income communities because those tended to be more investor owned properties. And we went out and took photographs. We had 39 points we were marking and comparing in homes in white, black, Latino neighborhoods. And when you look at the pictures, uh, I don't know the first one on yours, if you have Atlanta there, um, and I, I've looked myself, we've looked at probably about 3,000 homes now, and I have personally looked at over 500 homes. And I would, did a lot of work in Atlanta. And I would stand on the porch in a middle class, upper middle class African American community in Atlanta and look out and see five, ten other boarded up homes because of the bad loans that people were given, the fast foreclosures that initially started in the African American community. Now, we also have this problem of walk away, what they call zombie foreclosures. But you stand there and you look at this strong, economically previously strong African American neighborhood, and there's foreclosure after foreclosure after foreclosure. And then we said, how are they taking care of these properties? They have an obligation to maintain these homes so that the investor pool up here who's holding that mortgage, when they sell the house, they make some money. And when you look at Atlanta, you can see on the left-hand side this home that we went to. The, there, there is no grass. It's just overgrown weeds. There's trash all around. How did the trash get there? Now, let me explain to you. The neighbors didn't come and throw the trash there, okay? Let's be clear. What happens in a foreclosure is after the bank owns it, and whatever you've left in the house, they're supposed to go in, clean it out, cart it away. They're supposed to go in, clean the floors, paint the unit so it can be sold. What these companies have done instead, these banks without any monitoring, have people go in and do what's called the trash out, they throw it in the yard. Oftentimes they throw it in the backyard so if any quality control person's driving by, it looks okay in the front. So I need to be crystal clear, the neighbors did not trash this house. It was the bank and the people they hired who did not properly clean it up and put stuff out. We find no for sale signs in the African American neighborhoods. But when you look on the right hand side of this photograph, you would have no idea that that was a foreclosed home. You would just think that's a home that's for sale. Somebody's taking care of it and they're, they're selling it. Below you see the racial composition of the map of Atlanta. And these are census block maps, not full census tracts. So it drills down to show you how segregated Atlanta remains. When you look in Oakland, if you look at the Oakland picture, um, again, we were looking in middle class neighborhoods in Oakland, California. And you can see the stark difference. I was actually at this house. Um, we, couldn't, we, we take about 25, 30 photos of a property. But on this porch, there was an um, office chair and old telephone books. 
So some of the things that these banks tell us they do is once a week, the, they're supposed to be maintained. Once a week, the real estate agent who's listing the property is supposed to go by and take care of it. And you can simply see they don't do it. And again, you see a for sale sign, and you see the segregation in the Oakland area. Indianapolis, people have talked about, Indianapolis is talking about itself as being a city that it has no homes, no home ownership anymore. And you can see the comparison. What real estate agent wants to stop and show a house where it's all overgrown and there's trash? You know, would you be a little angry if your real estate agent took you up to a dump when you're looking for a house? So the real estate agents tell us, you know, we don't even want to show those houses. And you can see on the other side where they're taking care of it. In Denver, Colorado, we were out there um, just this past February, uh, and I was out here. And I could just look down the street as we were driving to look at the, for the foreclosures. Any place that didn't have the sidewalk shoveled was a foreclosure because the bank wasn't sending anybody out there. The properties are supposed to be secured. We find houses with doors open, windows unlocked, um, and it's, the segregation is there. So what's happening, though, is we have all these foreclosures in neighborhoods of color that are not being maintained. What if you live next door to one? What has that done to your property value? Can you refinance into a lower interest rate right now? Is your property value coming down and you're missing that opportunity for a 3% interest rate or 3.5 or 2.75, which I just refied into? Um, you know, you're losing that opportunity. And under the Fair Housing Act, those neighbors have standing to sue, the city has standing to sue because the city has to go out and take care of those properties. Every time, you know, there's rodents. We were at houses where there were dead animals. If you check on a house once a week, how does an animal die in that house? So this is what we found in middle class, working class, African American, Latino neighborhoods. We're in 25 cities now doing these investigations. A couple weeks ago, Wells Fargo settled with us. Um, and based on 19 of our cities, there, we've gotten $27 million, which is not nearly enough money, that we'll be making grants to homeowners, to people who want to buy homes, to people who are underwater in those neighborhoods, to help stabilize just not, like, not the city of Atlanta. We're only targeting particular zip codes where we were doing this work. We have an outstanding complaint against Bank of America, which my staff says, China, we think they're the worst of everybody we've looked at so far. Bank of America, what they're doing is auctioning a foreclosure rather than letting it get into the REO channel to be purchased by somebody. So when your house goes into foreclosure, it goes to a sheriff sale for an auction. Historically, the banks bid on the mortgage amount. So if the mortgage amount's $100,000, the bank bids 100. And then if I'm an investor or a buyer, if I bid more than that, I get it. What Bank of America has been doing routinely is not bidding at all. So in Atlanta, what we're seeing right now in the inner, when you're talking about the suburbs of, a, uh, of integration, Atlanta suburbs still are black and white suburbs. And what we found is that these big corporate brokers are now going in and buying up the foreclosures at auction to rent them out. And they, their business model is homes that are less than 20 years old and are way below market value. So by the banks not bidding on the property, we're seeing homes in Atlanta's African-American suburbs that ought to be selling for 100, 150,000 going for $57,000, $47,000 because the bank's not bidding. And these guys have come in literally with suitcases with three to five million dollars in cashier's checks because you have to pay cash when you're in an auction. They hire 30, 40 people. They go to each house. They bid on it. And now we see Atlanta's African-American middle-class suburbs turning into rental neighborhoods, not home ownership neighborhoods. In Austin, 
of the foreclosures go to, to, go to auction. In Austin, Texas, 71% in Atlanta go to auction. People say Phoenix has recovered. I'll stop in a minute. <laughs> People right. say Phoenix has recovered, but what happened in Phoenix, that's where Bank of America started its first auction program. So now all those homes are rental properties, and if I'm a homeowner, I'm getting top dollar from my house because there's no inventory. So there's incredible competition for the price of my house, and people are going, we've recovered. Mm. Phoenix has recovered. Not if you want to buy a house, mm. but now you're renting a house for more than what your mortgage was when you lost your home. The injustice that's going on is making my head explode. Um, and, you know, we intend that the well, I was glad Wells Fargo came to the table. It's very important for us to get somebody to resolve this initially. But every other bank out there, every other asset manager working for Fannie Mae, um, we filed a complaint against Safeguard, who's a big asset manager for Fannie Mae, and they're one of the biggest asset managers in the country for not maintaining Fannie's properties, yet billing Fannie and getting paid mm. by us. You know, this is, this is our money going back through there. We're looking at FHA properties and who FHA hires, and they're billing the federal government saying they mowed the lawn when they didn't. Those are false claims. But if we don't do something quickly in this arena, the neighborhoods are, are just going to deteriorate. Detroit is so sad to go into now. When you look at the city of Detroit, and we've been there recently, it's just you know block after block after block after block of foreclosures. And that's where the zombie foreclosures came from. When Bank of America was one of the first ones to do it in North Carolina, when an African-American family, when you get your notice of foreclosure and they say, you know, we're taking your house, a lot of people move out because it tells you, you know, get out, we're taking your home. Then the bank decides not to foreclose after they told you. Or they go through the whole foreclosure process, get a judgment, but never file it. Guess who owns the house? You do. You're supposed to be paying taxes and insurance. And so in North Carolina, an African-American family were about to be arrested by the city for not paying taxes and not maintaining the home because Bank of America walked away from the foreclosure and didn't find them and tell them. And they did that in Detroit right away because they said the house will sell for $5,000. It's not worth us to take it back. But they didn't tell the family, and the family left. And so now... The family has the legal liability for paying the taxes and maintaining the property. They haven't walked away from anything in Bel Air or Beverly Hills. You know, they hold those properties. So, so let me jump in because I know you guys have a lot to say about this. So, so let's start. What's the government's role in this before we get to the affordable housing issues? Yeah, I also want to talk about that with also in relationship to new neighborhoods because it feels like we're giving up on 80% of our country if we're only focusing on new neighborhoods. Yeah. And government has a, a lot of affirmative ob obligations to think about the tools that it's in, in their tool belt. And what the government does is if it defers to the what we call the private market, it's just deferring to historical discrimination. It's, just, it's deferring to people who are acting in a way that we know is discriminatory in nature. So. I do appreciate this new, new, the idea that new neighborhoods are the place that we're going to look for diversity, but there's not just racial diversity, we're talking about economic diversity too, and there are lots of tools that are available. In San Francisco, an example, they use uh, mandatory inclusionary zoning as an important tool, and they're looking at other cities like New York or talking about that, uh, where it says, we need to set aside for people of different economic means to have, whether it's housing or apartments, and we're going to guarantee that there's an economic diversity. And along with economic diversity comes other diversity. So the idea that, you know, new neighborhoods may just be, you may put up 100 houses, but they all end up being the same types of families. So maybe you have a racially diverse community, but you won't have an economically diverse community. And the richness of our societies that allow economic and racial diversity. So I think there are important tools around that. Low-income housing tax credits can be used in a positive way. I've seen it used in not so positive ways. Um, but there are opportunities then to use those tax credits to, to develop. What government does also around zoning and land use, we see you know, 
uh, neighborhoods where they only want to allow for single family homes. Uh, Maryland has a good uh, accessory dwelling unit uh, ordinance which talks about uh, mother daughter houses and that allows for diverse families. So people who have uh, parents and grandparents and have multiple families living and they want to have this uh, accessory dwelling unit. If we, if we had more opportunity and allowed accessory dwelling unit legislation around the country, it would encourage different family types to be moving into these houses. It would also encourage that, that economic and racial diversity we were talking about. Um, in New York, we have a huge system of rent regulation that doesn't exist in many cities around the country. But what rent regulation does, and I'm a proponent of rent regulation because it, it does say that people in neighborhoods matter and that if you've been in a community for 30 years, just because a neighborhood's gentrified, that doesn't mean you no longer can live there. There's a stabilization to the rent. There are rights to renewal leases. So there are for a million apartments in New York City, what rent regulation allows is allows them to, to know what the rent increases are going to be each year and stabilize those increases. So if neighborhoods change, if their units are rent regulated, people can, you know, example would be Harlem in, in New York where Harlem is gentrifying. Um, but people who are living in rent regulated houses, or regulated apartments, can remain in that community while the gentrification happens and stay in their community instead of being forced out like they in neighborhoods like Park Slope in Brooklyn where there aren't a large number of rent regulated units and then once a neighborhood gentrifies people are automatically evicted. So it allows, there are these important tools that the government can use to encourage this type of uh, economic diversity because economic diversity is an important piece of what we're talking about. Uh, the other thing about the new neighborhood phenomenon is I think it, with new neighborhoods, we're talking about um, mostly single family homes. We're not seeing large uh, suburban uh, residential units that are part large apartment complexes. You don't really see a lot of that in, new, in what we're terming new neighborhoods. Um, you're seeing mostly that in cities. So in New York City, uh, where I work and live, we still build five to 10,000 units of new houses, uh, new apartments every year. There are buildings that are built every day. So there's huge opportunities in those, in those new constructions to look at ensuring neighborhoods are diverse. There are, for government affordable housing programs, there are issues about community preference op uh, requirements. But in all construction, in neighbors all over the city, there's opportunities to force, whether it's a mandatory inclusionary zoning provision, whether it's tax credits. In New York, there's two. One's called the 421A and says in new construction, 20% of the units need to be set aside for affordable housing. So there are these important tools that can be used to allow this type of integration that we're talking about. So, so Diane, tell us, tell us why people live where they live and, and about the affordable housing aspect of this. I'm not sure I can answer the first question. <laughs> I could certainly tell you stories about why I've lived where I live over From the, the years, social science I, I don't think that's, yeah. uh, that's too helpful. What I, what I think I'd like to uh, talk about is pick up on the theme that everyone else has been talking about, um, starting with this concept that neighborhoods have a racial characteristic. And sometimes that racial characteristic is one that a neighborhood at a particular moment in time may be racially diverse. Traditionally in this country, racially diverse communities are not very sustainable and they exist for a very brief period of time. But you may find at a moment in time that there is a racially diverse neighborhood uh, within a particular city. Um, however, if we look at the neighborhoods that are not racially diverse uh, and that have uh, a racial characteristic uh, of, that is single race, uh, the, the issue that I've focused on in my work is what is the role of discrimination, of illegal discrimination in maintaining that, uh, that racial identity? I think one of the ways it happens now, a, a current issue for us, uh, and something that I sort of challenge all of you to think about in the communities that you come from and in the uh, legal advocacy work that you do, is how are racial uh, residents, how are residency preferences in local communities being used as a form of racial discrimination? So one thing that's common throughout the country is that housing markets are very decentralized. Uh, housing is not owned by one giant landlord, it's owned by many different landlords if it's rental. Many people own their own homes and when they sell them each time they're going out in the marketplace, they're using thousands and thousands of real estate brokers to assist with those transactions. So we don't have a centralized system of delivering housing, which means we also have a decentralized system for discrimination. 
but there are a few trends out there that um, are grouped into some categories uh, that uh, allow us to challenge them where we see them happening in our communities as a form of discrimination. And I, I want to just give you two examples. Uh, one is in the area of housing authorities uh, that operate Section 8 uh, voucher programs. These are rental vouchers that families who are lower income uh, receive and can use them to go out into the rental market and rent an apartment from a private landlord. Um, in Westchester County, which is a county north of New York City, um, it's one county. It has more than two dozen housing authorities and Section 8 programs. So one of the challenges we have is we've also decentralized our government housing programs as well at, to, that match up with the decentralized private market. And so each of those housing authorities are based in a particular city or town. So in, uh, in the town of um, Yorktown, which is the farthest north a suburb in Westchester County, a community that's more than 90% white, Yorktown has its own Section 8 program funded through, uh, through HUD through the federal government. And they have an administrative plan because they have fewer vouchers than there are a number of people who are eligible for them and need access to affordable housing. And that plan sets out how are they going to advertise when the vouchers are available, when people apply, how are they going to maintain the waiting list, and then how are they going to allocate those vouchers. Well, within that plan is something they call a residency preference, meaning that we will let anyone apply to our program, but we're going to put you on the waiting list in, in order of a residency preference so that anyone who already lives in Yorktown uh, but is lower income will get the first round of vouchers, uh, and anyone who uh, is, is an outsider, is not one of us, will go to the bottom of the list. Uh, and this is something that's permitted by Congress, unfortunately a, a horrible a uh, piece of legislation in the late 1990s called the Quality Housing Work Responsibility Act slid in the ability for communities to use these residency preferences. HUD promulgated a regulation saying, well, you can't use them in a way that has the impact, uh, the effect of discriminating, and that's a tool that those of us who are litigators use in challenging them. But it means that the towns have the ability to use a residency preference as a starting point. So what Yorktown does is a little bit of a twist on the residency preference. They could just let it run its course and it would have a disparate impact. Uh, and obviously, uh, low-income whites would receive uh, vouchers at a much higher rate uh, than, uh, than families of color. But what Yorktown has done is they like to open and close different parts of the waiting list at different moments in time. So if they run out of residents, they open the waiting list for anyone who's a resident and they close it for anyone who's not, which allows them to have more whites sign up to receive Section 8 vouchers. And then they start going back to the waiting list. And of course, in all their print materials, they do, they do market and they fill out their affirmative marketing plan for HUD, but what they put on their marketing is, if you're a resident, you have an approximate three-month wait. If you're not a resident, you have an approximate 15-year wait. So why would you apply? if you're not a resident? Why if you're an African-American resident in Yonkers or a Hispanic uh, family in White Plains, all residents of Westchester County, all in the same county, why would you even imply with that kind of a, a marketing plan? Uh, just to top it off, the local fair housing group also tested them and recorded the tests and found that there was a lot of steering going on, discouraging African-Americans and Hispanics from considering applying, reminding them of the 15-year wait. And for someone who was white, saying, well, you know, do you know anyone in town? If you could just come into town and live with them for a little while, we could count you as a resident of Yorktown and put you to the top of the waiting list. These residency preferences are being used throughout the country. And it's a, it's a critical issue because it's how a community that gets an allocation of public housing, of Section 8, of other affordable housing resources, can maintain its racial segregation, but still say, oh, we have affordable housing. Uh, we have a program that helps people who are low income. And the second twist, then, on residency preference that I wanted to bring your attention to is, uh, in New York, uh, we just finished suing two uh, co-ops. And it, when you think housing cooperative, you usually think vertical. It's a tall apartment building, and everybody uh, lives in the apartment building. These are more like homeowner associations. So these are residential neighborhoods. One has 700 homes and one has 300 single family homes. But they've organized themselves legally as cooperatives so they can control uh, who can uh, purchase homes. You have to go through uh, the process of applying to the cooperative and becoming a shareholder to move in. 
The communities were formed uh, about 30 years ago, both of them. Uh, they, the homes are, for uh, New York standards of home ownership, they are really working class and middle class uh, homes, the smaller bungalows, uh, along the waterway on the eastern side of the Bronx. So if you like to live on the Long Island Sound and see all the sailboats and be under the bridge, it's, it's really quite a pretty area, but the homes are very modest in size. No African American person has ever owned a single home out of the thousand homes in these two communities, ever. At one point, Judge Patterson, who is a, a, a senior uh, judge, a senior status judge in, uh, in the Southern District of New York, the man is 92 years old now. And he, during discovery, when they would not tell us the identity of the black homeowners, they said, we have them, we're pretty sure there are six of them, we do not know their identity. And he said he ordered them to produce the identity or at trial there would be a finding by the court that no black person has ever lived there. At the deposition last year of the president of one of the cooperatives, when I asked him whether they have homeowner association meetings that everyone comes to, he says, oh yes, everybody comes. It's packed. We do all of our uh, once a year. And are you at those meetings every year? Yes, I'm president of the board, a man who's lived his entire life in one of those cooperatives, now in his 40s. He's, he grew up and has lived his whole life there. I said, well, the last homeowners meeting that you were at, did you look out into the room and see who was there? Yes. Did you see a single black person in the room? And he said, I couldn't tell. I had forgotten to bring my glasses that evening. <laughs> so the way that we use who do you know, who can refer you, where do you live, who are your next door neighbors as the entree for how people get to choose where they live, those processes and those tools are going to be the way that we continue to make it difficult to change the racial characteristic of neighborhoods and to create more diversity. I just want to add a story to that because, you know, there's some cases that if you bring them to me, I get really excited and the housing ones are, and the voting ones are my favorites because it's like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> I mean, it's like if you want to be a real successful litigation person, you, you want to do some of these. So we had a case where there was Section 8 housing just outside of Los Angeles. And when you could finally get, because of course it took forever to get off the list and get into this housing, then basically the town targeted you. So you better not litter, you better not, you know, you better not drop something by accident and not get to it real quick because then basically the police would target you and then once they targeted you for that, you'd be kicked out of the housing. And it was really, you know, basically what they did. And so we, you know, we filed suit and then, you know, the second you start to point this out to people and you start to point out these patterns and practices, they're like, oh, well, we're not like that, we don't do that. And so we were able to really sort of change what it was like in those communities because in fact, they were being targeted. I mean, they didn't want to call it that, but that's what it was. And so, you know, this, this, this notion that it's just, you know, you, 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 people don't apply or they don't come here or, or they don't want to live in these places or people want them but they don't really want to come, you know, there's all these things that are off the grid. You know, people aren't measuring what happens to you when you get there. People aren't measuring these sort of, well, thank God we are, but measuring, you know, really without the testing, I think that's what's been so wonderful and more than em employment, housing has this great opportunity because it's the one place where you really can put people side by side and say same age, same gender, same family size, same this, same that, same that. It's one, you know, in, in employment that's a really difficult thing to do, but in housing, you know, it's just the biggest, brightest line ever. And sort of this notion that, you know, it's all been done, it's all okay, you know, whether you're looking at it from home ownership or whether you're looking at it from affordable housing, we have a really long way to go when you go to the neighborhoods and see what actually happens. And so I, when we talked about this on the phone, I kept saying, okay, all right, we're gonna lay out what is really not a pretty story. And, um, and of course, we have all these stories of actual cases where we can see the differences in the communities. You know, communities that where the town had an ordinance, I have a case where town had an ordinance, where affordable housing was only gonna be one bedroom apartment. Just one. No twos, no threes, just one. So that, that's a sign we don't want people who have families. And so um, if we just followed that out, it would, it would make us feel bad about where we're going. But I have confidence that each of you is going to talk about 
how we push this envelope and make this better. Because this is actually a problem that we can define in a way that you really can't define. Uh, you know, there's an objectivity about it that's different from some of the other things. Because you can, you can highlight the discrimination. You can highlight the disparate treatment. You can highlight how the government has rules that enforce a lot of this in a lot of ways. And or if they have a rule that doesn't enforce it, they are enforcing it. So, so with that, I want to turn to each of you and say, so, so what is this next generation? What do we all do so that the next time we talk about this, we're talking about how we took it from this place to a better place? Jacob, you want to start with that? So, I, yeah, and, and you know, I'll pick up on a, on a few things that have come out in the discussion. So there's, there's an enabling factor in, in housing market discrimination, which is housing shortage. If you want to see a real estate agent work really hard and throw all of, all of whatever you know, uh, prejudices they might have out the window, put them in a situation where there are lots of houses on the market and not very many buyers, okay? then they'll really work hard to, to find a house for, for buyers. Okay? When you have a housing shortage situation, where you have a situation where houses don't even go on the market because they go by word of mouth, that's the sort of situation where if you're a seller, you can be picky. Okay? Uh, and, and you might say, well, I, you know, I, I only want to sell this house to someone that I like. Okay? And your own personal prejudices can, it, can enter into it. When we talk about the parts of the country that have the most severe affordable housing problems, they are places that have housing shortages. If you can build a house for, say, $200 a square foot and turn around and sell it for $600 a square foot, as you can in New York and California and lots of parts of the country, there's a housing shortage. Okay? So, so when, when I think about what do we do about, uh, about this problem, uh, well, addressing housing shortages in the parts of the United States that suffer from them would go a long way. And in part, that means doing the sorts of things that we talked about already, the, the inclusionary zoning and that sort of thing. But to some extent, it's just a story of building more. And this is, so, so this, 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 this raises an essential tension, and I mean, this sort of goes back to some, some, some of the things that, that, that Harvey said. Um, when we talk about existing neighborhoods and we talk about trying to change existing neighborhoods, there's an essential tension there. Because the instinct of a lot of people who live in certain neighborhoods is to try to preserve the neighborhood. Okay? There's a tension between preserving it and changing it. Okay? And I think even, that, you know, it, even when we get to the point where we're saying, well, we want people who have been living in this neighborhood for 30 years to stay there, well, if the people who live there stay there, it's not going to change. Uh, so <coughs> if you want to see, you know, if, if you go 11 blocks north of here up to U Street, I mean, you'll see some of this tension in action. Uh, U Street is a, you know, that, that's a historically African-American business district that is undergoing a process of change. You will see uh, businesses that have been on that street for decades up against brand new condominium developments, okay? And this, this is where change is happening. And that neighborhood is much more racially integrated than it was 20 years ago. I mean, it's, it's uh, night and day. Uh, the difference in residential integration. The question is, is that something that we celebrate? Is that something that we fear? Uh, and I think that there's no easy answer to that. There, there is an element of both involved. But clearly, part of what's going on in Washington, D.C., it's another metropolitan area that has a housing shortage problem. There is a housing affordability problem here. How would you solve that housing affordability? Uh, the basic root of the problem is that more people want to live here than there are houses to, to hold them all. Okay? If you were to resolve that problem by just building enough houses for all the people who want to live in this city, it would involve taking neighborhoods that are you know, historically quite attractive, have these three-story row houses, blocks at block after block of row house, uh, tearing them down and building high-rises. Would we celebrate that or do we fear it? Um, these are some of the essential tensions that you find when it comes to housing affordability problems. But it's, it's, a, it's a question of what we want to prioritize as a society. If we prioritize preservation, we have to realize that preservation is sort of the opposite of change. Uh, if we want to change existing neighborhoods, we have to accept that some of the things that we want to preserve 
we're going to have to let go of because preservation and change are, are really hard to reconcile with one another. And so that, that's the main thing that, that I would encourage is that if we want to solve affordable housing problems, if we want to create a situation where there are more opportunities for more people to live in a wider array of neighborhoods, lowering the cost of housing by building more housing, right, resolving the shortage situation is one of the most important things we can do. Okay, right. Okay, Diane. The fair housing question and all that is where are we going to build that housing? Mm -hmm. And if we don't take that into consideration and we don't make that a central part of our plans to increase the supply of affordable housing, then we failed the next generation because that's the same mistake that was made by the generations before us. And so our challenge right now is not just how to create the policy programs that create more Section 8 vouchers or that uh, use, uh, create more tax credits for uh, private development or for housing authorities to build more sustainable community uh, units through new programs that HUD has. It's where is that housing going to be located? Um, and so, for example, um, if, um, let me just, I'll give you an example through uh, some testimony. Uh, a cross-examination I did two summers ago. I had the uh, marketing director for New York City's affordable housing department, the initials of the department are HPD. Uh, we were trying to get a preliminary injunction to stop the city uh, from redevelopment in a community where it was going to be giving a preference to the Hasidic residents of the community uh, by drawing a community district line down a boulevard in which one side of the boulevard north was primarily Hasidic occupied the other side of the boulevard was 80% uh, African American. And so our argument was by drawing this artificial line and giving a preference to the residents on the north side, th this very critical increase in supply and affordable housing was going to go to whites and not to uh, African Americans and to uh, uh, Hispanic families in, in Brooklyn, uh, which is a very racially diverse uh, borough overall in terms of total numbers. So the marketing director was on there, and I was, uh, he testified about a bunch of things for the city. We hadn't had depositions. I didn't know what I was walking into. You know, it's always one of those, like, don't ask a question on cross-examination unless you know the answer. But you can't. It's a preliminary injunction. You haven't had discovery. You're going to have to ask. You're going to have to do it in a strategic and targeted way, but you have to find these things out. And as I pushed and pushed this man about how the city ran its programs, he finally blurted out. He said, well, you know, now that I think about it, we've actually built so much of our affordable housing in the South Bronx that there aren't enough poor people left to qualify for that housing in those neighborhoods. But because we continue to apply a community district, we don't reach the rest of the city. We could have built more in this neighborhood. He's not an attorney. He's not a social scientist. He's not an economist. He was just a guy in charge of the housing market department for the city of New York. And it finally dawned on him under the pressure of the situation that no one in the HPD department, no one in the mayor's office had been thinking about where are they building the affordable housing. So that is the critical question as we go forward. It's not just how much do we build it, how many vouchers do we have, but how, where do we create the housing and do we create it in a way that encourages mixed income and racially diverse communities. Does he still work there? Um, he does. But the city's um, marketing, housing, affordable housing marketing plan was revised uh, three months after the hearing. Uh, and I'm happy to say it's a, it's a great improvement over the last one. And we did obtain a preliminary injunction. Uh, so hopefully that will lead us to some strong settlement discussions in the future with the city. So Harvey, what do you have to add? I, I would also add to that conversation, it isn't just the, the location of the units, it's also the size. I think Kim, you said it earlier, you know, if for that development, so they're building seven bedroom apartments for Hasidic families that maybe most people in the community don't need. They need one and two bedroom apartments. So if they're only build, building really large units, they're steering it towards a population. I think that's really important. The other thing is we need to talk about transportation. Like if we're building neighborhoods and building communities without infrastructure, if there's no bus system, there's no uh, metro system, there's no way for people to get around, you're deciding who's going to live there. You're making a decision up front that this is for a certain income group. And that's where government has a assertive obligation. We see this happening all over 
I mean, I feel like I live in New York, and that's what Robert Moses did to, to our state. It's right, we're going to put the Long Island Expressway in the middle of this neighborhood so people who have cars and mostly white middle class families are going to live there. And that's what we see all over the country. If we don't think about infrastructure, we don't think about buses, we don't think about public transportation, we're never going to have a, a country that's going to be economically and racially integrated, and that's really what we need to talk about. We need to talk about this, the impact of government's action or inaction in, in, in these activities. And we, I, it's really hard to control private actors, but I think we have some control over our government. You know, in theory we vote, in theory we, we have elected representatives, in theory they should be able to do what we want, but we're not talking to them about these needs and I think if we spend our time saying, well, what is the infrastructure needs here? How is this program going to be implemented? What are we thinking about the impact of this new development? How is it going to affect our community? Is this going to be a racially and economically diverse development project? If we start asking those questions and thinking about policies that are in include, you know, are we using low-income housing tax credits? Are we requiring mandatory inclusionary zoning? If we're putting these things on the table as potential solutions, then I think we can, as we move forward, create pockets of integration and show that they're successful. Okay. So, Sean, I'm going to give you the last word on what we do to make our future a lot brighter. Well, this year is the 45th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act, and many of you may not know that the law was passed in seven days after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered. Um, the Fair Housing Act is pretty much the stepchild of the civil rights movement because when you see documentaries on the civil rights movement, they all stop in like 1965. And you don't see documentaries talking about the Fair Housing Act. On the 40th anniversary, the Washington, the National Lawyers Committee, the Leadership Conference on Human and Civil Rights, and the National Fair Housing Alliance had a commission and Henry Cisneros and um, Jack Kemp were our chairman for this commission, and we had hearings in eight cities across the country. You can get a copy of that report on our website. One of the things we talked about was a regional approach to fair housing, so that you have, you incorporate what people have been talking today about with low income and affordable housing issues, but you also have an approach that opens up communities so that we don't have economic segregation. We talked about the intergovernmental cooperation agreement. Under President Carter, it was first enacted where all the departments, Department of Transportation, Human Services, Health and Human Services, Department of Education, EPA, were all supposed to have meetings to talk about what is the fair housing component in their departments? If you think of health and human services, we have health care centers that are concentrated. And so why would I move out if I can't get access to the health care that I need? And under um, President Clinton, they were supposed to be reactivated. And now under President Obama, um, they've had one meeting. The Secretary of HUD is supposed to convene this broad group. Um, Secretary Donovan has been doing a little more work than anybody else has. But under this, it, it would also include Department of Defense um, because we have military bases all over and they experience a lot of discrimination when they're looking for housing. So we, for government policy, all of these departments are supposed to have an affirmatively furthering fair housing plan. The problem is, um, the Housing and Community Development Act was passed in 1974, and we still do not have a regulation that's been promulgated to tell people how to affirmatively further fair housing. Secretary Donovan promises it'll be out this year. Uh, I'm not really good at math, but somebody else can figure out from 1974 to now how long that's been. We need to have these guidelines that will teach cities and they also, my understanding of the guidelines will be that there will be a push for a regional approach. And the federal government can create that regional approach by controlling EPA dollars, DOT dollars, HHS dollars, education dollars that go into these communities. Instead of waiting as they did with that long litigation against the Baltimore Housing Authority 
to have a regional approach to affordable housing. The federal government can take the lead in that because money is a motivator. So if um, Westchester County wants to do it right with their more than two dozen housing authorities, they want some money. They could require them to have a regional approach, not just in Westchester County, but throughout that area. And for you individually, um, what I would encourage you to do is two things. When you're looking for an apartment or when you're ready to buy a house, if you're being steered, if you're white and somebody says, because I'm white and I've done a lot of testing, and they'll say, don't worry, there are no black people living here, you as a white person can bring an action. If they say to you, uh, oh, I don't know if you want to buy this house, your neighbors will be Indian. If they say, uh, as they've done in Atlanta, there are a lot of Asian Americans who've moved into the Atlanta area saying, you don't want to move over there, that's where the Vietnamese live. So if anybody makes a comment to you, you have standing under the Fair Housing Act. So when you're looking for an apartment, when you're looking to buy your house, um, do something, report it. The other thing I would encourage you to do is we've been talking about testers, and testers we just trained a group of 17 testers last night in our office. And testers, we need them all ages, all nationalities, all races, and we use you to figure out what's really going on. Um, the way the National Fair Housing Alliance structures it is the tester of color, or the protected group tester, is more qualified. They make a little bit more money. They drive a nicer car um, so that when I have a jury sitting there, it's not like the white and the African-American were equal. The African-American was better qualified. So that when a jury looks at it, the, the, it's hard to say, well, you know, that white person seemed a little friendlier. After all, they were equal. I took them. Um, it's an economic decision. It's not supposed to be a racial decision. So we need testers. And um, whether you're a lawyer or not, you can be a tester. And I would encourage you in your communities, you can go to our website and see if there are fair housing centers where you live, or you can become a tester for the National Fair Housing Alliance, because we have testers all over the country. So a regional approach, get the affirmatively furthering regs out so communities, governments understand how to affirmatively further fair housing, and then you as individuals do something, do something. So with that, I have saved a few minutes just for questions from the audience, and I see one right there. Takers. I, I, just personally, I'm a big fan of land trust. I feel like that you know they've used been, been used in a really positive way, and also a big fan of rent regulation. So those two tools are, I think, are really important tools. Uh, I think the problem is you that the ideas are not he had, that those ideas have not penetrated around the country. So the idea that you take a you know a former uh, farm um, as we've talked about, and then build create a land trust with 500 homes on it is something that you'd, I think you'd have to f get there a deeper understanding why land trusts are good and why regulatory provisions are good or why a set aside should be set aside for people of economic, uh, different economic means or some opportunity to use uh, an inclusionary housing provision. So uh, I think those are uh, harder tools in non-urban locations and I think uh, because there isn't been a rich history, you know, and uh, I actually know in Nassau County they tried to to use an uh, inclusionary housing tool, and it just it, there isn't that mindset. It's going to take a long time, so it requires a lot of neighborhood conversations, working with community-based organizations, 
in communities around the area to do some kind of base building and education, but I think there are, I think there would be valuable tools. So uh, in, in real estate, they say location, location, location. So that adage applies. So if you want, I, I mean, I went house hunting with my, uh, my brother and sister-in-law in Seattle uh, a little while ago. And this is while the housing market was supposedly in bad shape. If you wanted a house in a desirable neighborhood in Seattle, these would be you know, the areas on the north side of town where you, know, they, they, you, you might call them yuppie neighborhoods or whatever you want to do it. Um, there was not a lot of stuff on the market. Housing was turning over without going on the market. Um, if you're willing to live out, way out, you know, 45 minute commute away, yeah, there's tons of inventory out there. But, uh, you know, we, the, the housing markets are local markets. And so uh, if you look across the country, there are gonna be some places where you have shortage environments where the housing is very expensive, uh, a la Seattle. And then you're gonna have places where housing is, is plentiful, where there actually are a lot of vacant units on the market, uh, and there you'll find downward pressure on prices. Uh, so, but I think if you, if you just sort of look at data for individual markets across the country, you'll see that even, even over the past few months, there, there's been divergence. Some markets are heating up and others just aren't. But there's also a shadow inventory that the banks have been holding off the foreclosures in predominantly white, middle, and higher income communities. They roll it out house by house or a few houses at a time so that they can drive up the price and get the highest price. They were doing that in Montgomery County, Maryland. We were looking at Montgomery County, Maryland versus Prince George's County, Maryland, and saw a glut of foreclosures in um, Prince George's, even though our database showed us there were a lot of foreclosures in Montgomery County, but they weren't on the market. So there, there is that manipulation of the price and the cost of housing in white neighborhoods. Do you have any questions? I was wondering, oh, sorry. I was wondering if you've also seen a difference in um, the willingness of banks to go through HAMP modification in depending on the neighborhood it's in. And then um, also a little bit related, I was just wondering why banks are doing what you're saying they're doing in places like Atlanta, not taking care of homes in black neighborhoods and trying to resell them, because it doesn't seem that that's ultimately in their economic interest. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, discrimination is not rational. Um, so when economists will always talk to me and they've historically said, you know, what you're saying is not rational. Um, it's not in the bank's economic best interest to do this. Well, and that's correct. But uh, I've never yet found somebody who's racist to be rational. Um, the banks, their, what their defense is, I'm trying to think of what they've said to me of why this is happening. Um, first of all, they just don't believe it till I show them the pictures. And um, then they tell me they have all these quality control measures in place. But I've said, is your quality control measure focused on communities of color? Because this is really where your problem is. No, we do 10% quality control all over the city. When our employees are driving home, we have them look at houses. And I'm like, did you pin dot where your employees live? You know, if they live in white neighborhoods, they're looking at your white foreclosures. So th there, there's no economic reason for them to do this. What bothers me most is the big pension holders, you know, the Ohio PERS, Cal PERS, all of those guys have investments in the mortgage market and they should be putting pressure on the banks to take care of these homes. Um, I forgot the first part of the Sometimes question. people need to be reminded that money is green and doesn't have other colors, and so that's what happens. They, they, they do it the way they've been doing it, and the way they've been doing it is letting people do it after work or not really systematically checking in certain mm -hmm. neighborhoods, or you know, their model is that, oh, well, these houses don't really matter, but these houses do, so, so that's how they yeah, get it. I, 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 I just want to say, Freddie sure. Mac and Fannie Mae are different as night and day. We brought this to it, the attention of Freddie, Fannie, and Bank of America in 2009. Um, Freddie took it very seriously. When I go into a neighborhood now, I can tell a Freddie Mac foreclosure because it looks great. It's clean, it's mowed, it's great. 
And all they did in their business model, this is not rocket science, they picked local real estate companies to list the homes. They picked lo local preservation management companies to mow the lawns. When we were in Chicago's Latino neighborhoods, the guys who were doing the work were Latinos. They were from the neighborhood. They had pride in the neighborhood. They were taking good care. The other banks hire these big national companies who rip off the profits up here and pay less and less and less when it comes down to the trash out or the mowing of the lawn. So what, and we've been telling them, you know, this is not rocket science. You know, you're just supposed to be mowing lawns and cleaning up trash and keeping a house clean. That's not hard to do. But they, they, they don't have respect for the neighborhoods. When, when we were meeting with someone recently, the president and CEO of the company, when I was showing him a middle class neighborhood in an African American community, a nice house, he kept saying, well, in these low income neighborhoods, in these low income neighborhoods. <laughs> and um, one of our vice presidents who's African American, she just went, why do you keep calling it a low income neighborhood? And you know, having a, a, a black woman yell at him scared, scared him. And he didn't know what to say. And so I had to explain to him why it was offensive of what he was saying and doing. But this is from the top of the company down. So there's no, there's stereotypes and no respect for communities of color. Great stereotypes by these banks and the people who work for them. Because if you don't use people in the community to help the economy grow, um, give people jobs, you know, if you bring somebody from the outside, I, I, I saw a Sotheby's sign in the heart of an African American neighborhood in Oakland, California this week. Um, I just came back and I went, Sotheby's doesn't sell in this neighborhood, but the bank gave them the listings in the Oakland Hills. Mm, and so they had a listing, you know, in an African American neighborhood that they, they weren't marketing. And the house had graffiti on it, and there was nothing that had been fixed up. So it is all the racial stereotypes, the bias, the discrimination that we all carry in our lives. And but we have to figure out how to address it and get rid of it when we're working in business. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something? Sure. So let me, uh, let me talk as an economist, <laughs> uh, which, you know, so I'm an economist who doesn't do banking. I mean, people are always asking me for financial advice. I'm not a financial economist, okay? <laughs> so let's get that out of the way. Yeah. But I know some financial economists, and they are all about making money. So I will say that, you know, they might have to, if we, if we told them to go back and think about it, maybe they'd change their mind. But the decisions that they make, they're making those decisions because they think they will make the money. They're, some of their biases may be involved in this determination of whether they think they're going to make money. But money is what it's about. And so if you think about, you know, why, so take a question like, why would, you, uh, why, why would you be slow about putting your inventory on the market in Montgomery County, but be real quick about it in Prince George's? Uh, well, what the banker thinks is that if, if I can make more money by, the, by giving the housing out a little bit at a time in Montgomery, because I think that the price is going to go up in Montgomery. And so if I hold on to my housing units for a longer period of time, I can wait, wait a little bit and make more money. If you think that the price is not going to go up in Prince George's, then you say, all right, I just, I'm going to cut my losses. I'm just going to get out of that market now. And so it's, it's that kind of logic. Is that logic based on discriminatory thoughts? Yeah, I gotta say Quite possibly. But it's also a thought that, that is, is based on money making. So well, there's, there's, no, there's not necessarily an either or there. I have to respectfully disagree with that last part because in Prince George's County, first of all, it is the highest earning African American community damn near in the country. And they replaced a white population that made less money. But yet, they didn't even get the economic development. I mean, they have had to really like jump up and down and say, you better bring some real stores here. And I, you know, my big joke used to be, you had to, you could live in Prince George's and basically a mansion, but you had to drive to go to any of the high end. You, you couldn't go to a Nordstrom, which is, I don't even consider the highest end. And so they really, I mean, and the, and the question became like to economists, I took econ, I, I won't say I'm an economist, but I did study in an undergrad. And you would say to an economist, but, but how can this be that richer people are provided with lower sort of 
uh, financial opportunities to spend all this extra money, and people would go, "We don't understand this phenomena," and they and then they, and then you, then they do all these studies on how the people before had less money, and it always came back to the same thing: people saw black, they didn't see money, mm -hmm. and when they saw black, they thought black people just want you know liquor stores and churches. And, and, and here we are, you know, here we are in Prince George. I mean, really, some of the nicest home. I mean, you can go in a home in, in Prince George's that looks just like one out on River Road or Potomac or, or anywhere. But when it comes to what opportunities they have to spend money, people saw black and not that they made more money than some parts of DC, some parts of places where you really see people make money. And this notion that it was just about the money it doesn't play because it took them decades. I mean, I, they, I, there's probably people in the room who can do it better than I am, but can pull out the studies mm -hmm. from where people had to go, and then and they would go out to people, and people go, "We didn't know," like, yeah, and yeah. you're like, "But we're showing you how much money they right. make, and we're showing you what you do," and people would go, "Oh, we didn't know." So, so yeah, you know, when you're an economist and you're just thinking about money, you just assume that there's some profit motive because, like you said, mm -hmm. that's logical. But you know, at the NAACP, we have this joke: you're using logic, and logic does doesn't work here. And so it's the same in Prince George's County with these people who, again, lawyers, doctors, sometimes two lawyers, two doctors, and their kids all go to private schools because they can't really go to school in Prince George's County and keep the, keep the level of life that they're used to. So they are going somewhere else for this stuff. So the money's there, the income is there, the style of living is there, but they're all driving you know, 50 miles to get to Neiman Marcus because there isn't one in Prince George's County. And they just got, I mean, it's a really big deal that they built the harbor over there. And, that, and again, a long, if you lived here, a long fight because people kept saying, why would we develop there? And it was because they saw black and not green. And I, so I disagree. With that. Can I also argue the same thing about HAMP because I think it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, why haven't banks done HAMP modifications? Um, it, it, it's hard to imagine a modification is actually financially beneficial for the bank 95% of the time. And we would argue with the banks all the time, well, this is actually better for you. If you foreclose on this home, you're going to lose so much money. You do this modification now, actually you're going to make money. It's going to be better for you long term. And time and time again, it's uh, banks wouldn't get it. It would be the person, well, I don't know if I can do that. I don't have the authority. We'll go up the chain, talk to the next. It was just time and time again. It, 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 it isn't money. There's something else going on there, and it has to be race. It just has to be. And I just want to say about Prince George's County, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy of putting you know, the houses on the market. You glut the market. You drive down prices. They could have used the exact same strategy that they, that they are using in Montgomery County and Prince George's to limit the um, number of homes on the market so they could keep the prices stable or increase the prices. But what we found instead was that um, they wanted to clear their inventory so they put it out, put them down at low prices, and start auctioning. If they would have auctioned in Montgomery County, there would have been an uproar from the white residents with their members of government, and government would have stepped on the banks about driving down property values, which drive down tax revenues and school uh, revenues in the area. And while that roar came up in Prince George's County, the banks ignored it. Um, but if you look across the United States with foreclosures in white communities, there's in middle class and, and upper income white communities, you don't see the glut of housing of, of foreclosures being put on the market. So it was their own self-fulfilling prophecy. They say, we're losing money, we got to get rid of the inventory. But they created the problem. So I have the red sign, which tells me to stop. They're so organized here. So um, we want to thank you. This has been great. I want you to thank this great panel. Very lucky to have.